So by now everybody knows who I am, but for the video, uh, Rob Beezer from the University of Puget Sound. I, uh, as organizer for the, for the EDU days, these talks on, on content, I, I'd ask people to do pretty much what people have done. Try and show us what's available in a certain area of SAGE, maybe some of the gotchas for using it, how they get used in their courses, things of that sort. And, uh, and I've been working very hard this year with the linear algebra. But the truth is, I've never really required SAGE in my linear algebra course yet. I've done a lot of that in, in abstract algebra, so that's most of my experience with uh, really saying you need to, uh, to use this. So I, I it abused my prerogative as organizer, and I'm going to do not exactly what I asked everybody else to do for these talks, and, and talk a little bit sort of about uh, my year-long sabbatical that I'm kind of getting to the end of, and working with certainly SAGE and linear algebra, but sort of the experience of trying to put material in the book, fix up linear algebra and SAGE. So, this is sort of a premature sabbatical report. At my university, we get a, a semester as sort of a standard deal. So you, you certainly need to put in a proposal and write a report and those kind of things. But uh, it's about as close to automatic as it, as it might get. We also have a program where uh, about five grants are given every year to post-tenure faculty uh, who put in a proposal and, uh, and want to do something, and you get an extra semester, as it were, so you know, the full pay and all that, so sort of double up your sabbatical. And I've applied for those before, and, and my proposals weren't real imaginative, and, and they weren't funded. This year, I, I had this idea, and it's part of what we're doing on the grant, but uh, doing work on my open source linear algebra textbook, putting a lot of SAGE instruction in there, working on SAGE itself, and I've been working some on Tom's abstract algebra book. And at, at my university, where we do a whole lot of teaching and, and we don't offer much beyond a, a bachelor's degree, we really don't have any kind of graduate program to speak of in, in any discipline, uh, that, that looked good. That, that was something that I think the committee saw a lot of value in, and it's certainly going to pay off in the abstract algebra and linear algebra courses that I teach that are a big part of my responsibility. I certainly teach a lot of calculus like everybody else. And I'll slowly, I'm working my way down the curriculum. That's sort of yeah. my approach to SAGE. And I think that where it started at a high level. And um, you know, the calculus the calculus is actually harder, I think, in terms of implementing the symbolics. I got a lot of respect for her and others who do the symbolic stuff. I think that's, that's hard. So, uh, so this is just sort of a, a rough outline of what I've been doing. Last semester, I spent a lot of time with this textbook conversion, getting that working. And a lot of that was from trial and error, working through books, and uh, doing a lot of test runs. I went uh, to the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences, and if you read the SAGE list, that's sort of a SAGE connection. I'll talk about that, but they use SAGE there, and they're always looking for people that can come and teach some mathematics with SAGE. So that was a great experience, and, and that, was, that was a fun thing to do. It was hard work, but it was also helped a lot with my linear algebra and what I was going to do with the textbook. I uh, came back from Africa and, and through some point this summer working on the linear algebra, so that's where I've been spending a whole lot of my time. Tom had the opportunity to teach abstract algebra this past spring, and that was a little earlier than I'd expected, and so uh, I got on my horse and tried to stay a couple of weeks ahead of Tom, so I was doing the abstract algebra this spring when I was sort of thinking of postponing it to the summer, but that's worked out real well. And that, there, there's a real fun thing to do. Spent a few weeks organizing two SAGE days. Uh, I think I, I, I certainly have some linear algebra patches to finish up, but uh, sorry. Uh, I think I'm going to sort of shift into tidying up my conversion system and actually converting a few more books. Lots of opportunities to travel, such as going up to Nova Scotia to Eva's SAGE days a few weeks ago and, and lots of other places. Uh, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. Uh, like I said, a good experience. One of the, they have several programs, uh, you know, postgraduates and, and summer courses and workshops and those kind of things. But their biggest, the biggest thing that's going on is that they have this one-year program where they bring in 55 students from all across the continent. So just about every country has been represented at some point. They just got somebody from Somalia for next year, so they've not had Somalia. They're only about seven or eight years they did. Uh, when I was there, there were probably about 20 to 25 countries that were represented. Students take uh, a, a three-week course, two hours each of the five days. 
in the beginning, they have to take two certain courses. Everybody's doing it. Later on, three courses are offered. They choose two from among the three. And then they write uh, sort of a mini master's thesis. They write a pretty big presentation sort of preparation for eventually having to write something of that sort down the road. And they just have been finishing those up. And I've looked at a couple of those from students that I got to know. And they look pretty nice. Uh, they bought an old hotel at auction close to the beach in Cape Town, South Africa. And uh, so it's kind of, a, kind of a fun place to be. Uh, the bottom floor has got a cafeteria and the old lobby, and they put some classrooms down there. Second floor is offices and uh, computer lab and library. And the top two floors are just the rooms from the old hotel, and that's where everybody lives, including the people that are coming in to do a three week place. Uh, so, yeah. so the fa are the faculty also staying? The Certainly the people that are just already in for three weeks at a time are. Some people are there for six months on a mm -hmm. you know extended visit that are. But like yeah, it's sort of everybody's in the same building. They're right in the time. same building. So uh, sort of fun story. There were two gals from Sudan with the headscarves and, and, the, and the whole deal. And my room was on a corner and, and there were probably of the fifty five students, maybe twelve women. So Good representation, but certainly not 50 50. And all the women were sort of down the wing right from my corner, and there was a door you could close off that way. And I came up, I've been there for three or four weeks, and I came up the stairs, and this one gal, uh, Molly, I think, anyway, she let me go first. It was fine. She followed me up the stairs. And I went into my room, and it was clear that her room was right next door to mine. And she looked at me, and she said, Oh, we're neighbors. And just sort of this. You know, like I never thought I'd be living in, you know, communally with a man in the room next door was certainly a fresh mess. Just little experiences like that. Uh, I can show you, I think I've got it up. My network connection is a little weird. So this is uh, what's called Musenberg, which is the, the suburb of whatever. It's Cape Town city limits, but Cape Town physically is huge. You can take the train for 40 minutes and still be inside of Cape Town. Obviously, the beach there uh, south is that way. This is called False Bay, and the right arm of False Bay takes you down to Cape Point and the, the Cape of Good Hope. So if you were to look, you can see mountains down this way as well. Uh, that's the institute right there. It's sort of that pre pre yellow colored building. So it is literally just a block. It is literally just a block. It's a nice coffee shop right there. <laughs> I investigated all the coffee shops the first morning. Nothing opened till eight, which shocked me. And one place was particularly welcoming when I went in to ask about hours, and uh, it turned out they just opened. And I sort of became one of their first regular customers. And I brought lots of, apparently, apparently everybody at the Institute now is going there for coffee. So there's a little, little tighter view. Uh, that's sort of the public pavilion. There's a water park there. Uh, I was in the corner right here. So one window looked directly south, and this is a big popular surfing beach. My window along the other side and my little bathroom window looked out just, just down the beach about seven or eight miles, I'd say, and that's where the sun came up over there. So. So it's sort of some of my best memories are, are shaving in the morning and, and peeking out the window and watching the sun come up. <laughs> There's a little tighter view. So like on the second floor, that's the library. Those are the offices, and in that wing is the computer lab. Uh, it's not really about buildings and beaches and mountains. It's about the people. And there's sort of a tradition as the lecturers depart after their three-week deal, there's sometimes a little party or a tea or different things happen. Uh, they ended up having a, it was Madagascar cultural night, the Thursday before my last Friday. And I just thought it was Madagascar cultural night. It was also my goodbye party, my, my send-off. And it was sort of the first party the students had had. And there's no alcohol in the building. But there was lots of dancing and, and all that kind of stuff. And it was really interesting to see that the students were all a lot closer group than seen the next morning, who's having sort of had this big party at this point. Uh, this fellow is at Oxford. He comes and teaches a lot. 
He's at Stellenbosch University, retired, uh, lives, lives maybe 40 minutes away. He would, he would stay in the building all week and then just go home for the weekends, even though he could have made a commute out of it. Uh, that's the director, Barry Green. And you know, at one point, that was the one fellow from Egypt, so I've, of course, been thinking about him a lot. There's one of the Sudanese gals. I, can't, I don't see the other one. Anyway. Is Jan in that picture? Who? Jan? Uh, I don't think he is. I have another one. You know, I only had what I had locally. All my photos are on my server at home that I really can't get to really easily. I don't see Jan. Jan Gronwald is the IT guy who's very good with Linux and things and, and has fixed some, some nasty, or at least exposed some nasty bugs in, in Sage and Ubuntu and things like that. And, uh, and he's the one who's always saying, please come help us teach courses. So he gets involved in the curriculum and the administration. But he's really Uh, let's see if my, I could tell you stories about every one of those, well, maybe not every one of them now, but the there. Yeah, so let's go course. That's going to take a yeah. So if you want to get an idea of what I did in three weeks, linear, do some linear algebra, Gaussian elimination, LU decomposition, Hermitian matrix. These were, these were each sort of one day's worth of topics, and you'll see a lot of sage Worksheets posted. They have eight tutors, they call them, like graduate assistants. Uh, Bruno Flesch from France would take great notes on the fly every day, and, then, and they'd be up like within a half hour. So I've got a complete set of notes. I'm not used to I'm not used to giving courses where the students take notes. I know that happens in the graduate programs all the time. So anyway, uh, who was it? Hamid, Hamidou asked. I'm going to do Sage World Tour. It's the last day, can we just see a whole bunch of other stuff in Sage? So, you know, you got to be a little bit flexible and, and go with what's going on. That's not worse. So that was really, uh, it was really a good experience for me. I mean, I didn't have to grade papers. I didn't give grades. You know, I just, I just rolled in and, and talked about linear algebra and Sage for a couple hours. And then I'd spend a lot of time in the lab. I think maybe that's what's next. To so there is no grading or exam. Well, yeah, so this, I, I think this is a cons consequence of my being there for the early round of courses. So I think they were trying to get everybody up to speed without too much pressure. And, and there's a lot of Francophones. English is the language, but there are a lot of French people from French-speaking countries with variable English skills. There is a full-time English, you know, a woman employed to be the, the English teacher. And, and, and she's got like four groups of students according to their abilities and how much work they need. She's also sort of the social director. She's the one that would organize outings in the Cape Town to, to go to the opera and things like that. Was that a question? Yes, it did. Why are they 100% safe? What is it? Is it well, they're 100% open source because um, because these people are going to go back to Sudan, where you know their experience. And I, I'm just I'm thinking of a certain student from Sudan, but any of these countries. Uh, at their university, they get 15 minutes on the internet, and the connection is horribly slow. They, they're not going to buy Mathematic. Well, okay, it's the usual story that you know I've got version whatever of MATLAB, and it's because they didn't pay for it. But, you know that stuff is out there, and and you know you can't expect them to buy and even have shipped a textbook for your course necessarily. So I was lecturing out of open source books, but some other books I mentioned in class uh, in the lab one night, and just saw this, this beautiful, beautiful scanned version of a book that you know commercial book. Really, I mean, it drives home the point that, that people are going to go find books, you know, without paying for them. They're, up, they're all out there on the sites, and they all know where they are. So. Yeah, so it's, it's the idea that they're going to go and teach someplace, hopefully in Africa, and they just can't afford to yeah. be paying licenses for mathematics. That's great. Uh, so I think that's good. Yeah, okay. So there's where, so, you know, two hours in class and, and six hours hanging out in here with the students. And it always looks like the place is wrecked. These chairs are just weird. They just sort of fun. <laughs> uh, it looks like everything's broken. That's just the way they were designed. They're comfortable chairs. So I would I would just work this room. And uh, I'd sometimes for a couple hours, and then I'd go back to my office for an hour, and I'd come back. But I'd be in here late at night, usually, and so would they. Um, pretty good machines. I mean, they've got, they've got good hardware. I'm sure somebody's going to Good, good computing environment. Really nice computing environment. People that know what they're doing. 
He's from Zimbabwe. I think he's from Ethiopia. I, I know that's Siddiqui Zongo from his shirt. That was the only guy. He was the only guy with light green with that striped shirt. That's a more typical view of the lab. Just they're always in there, just generally trash with papers and water bottles. Uh, and if you if you go to Africa, you might have the opportunity to see a cheetah. Right. It's just brought down a little bit. <laughs> see him bring it down? No, but we, we we got there just in time for it. It strangled it. it. It was just sort of in the death grip, and about two minutes later, it let it go. Che you know, cheetahs, everybody knows cheetahs are incredibly fast, but what I didn't know is that after they run for 90 seconds, they got to lie down for a half hour. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. So. <laughs> <laughs> So this is this is sort of just after the kill, and, and he, uh, he or she is just catching, catching breath, and uh, eventually picked it up and dragged it under a tree pretty quick. Cheetahs are low on the totem pole. If if the lions find it, they take it. If, if anybody finds it, they take it. And he was downwind or whatever it was, and got it underneath a tree. And we came back the next morning, and then the two of them were still there. So managed to get a meal out. We, in, in, we were going to find the zebra kill when we got the call on the radio that the wildebeest incident was, was going on. So there's there's the zebra, there's the lion, the local lion pride, and uh, the cubs were running in and out of the carcass there. Wow. Yeah, so we so we watched it strangle it, and then we knew it would be a while. We went back to look at the zebra. Kill. This was one of the wildest days we had, or wildest say three hours we had. Then we went back. You might also see a pack of wild dogs. So genetically very similar, but distinct, endangered. This is the airstrip at the uh, second camp we went to. And that's a fairly large, we saw one wild dog shortly after, the first one and only one we saw at the other camp shortly after those two kills I showed you. That was a bad sign that that wild dog was alone. They they did the impact. It was not good. But this one wild dog was running out of uh, You might also happen to show up in camp when the wild dog researchers are around, and your guide, who probably started as a hunting guide, uh, darted the dog. And it's even funnier when when the this was sort of, we were at a very corporate camp, you don't get out of the truck, and then we went to this other camp where it's sort of mom and pop operation, that being pop. And, uh, you know, we're sitting in the truck when they pull up to get ready to dart the dog. And they all get out of the truck, and they're mixing up the tranquilizer. We just arrived the day before. And my wife says, are you using ketamine in that? You know, the trick, the, the, the medicines they're using. And they look at her and they say, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a veterinarian. So she got, to, she got to help out with the dog, uh, drew some blood, and some water, and some temperature. Uh, mom and Pop, she's a licensed guy. They're both licensed, to, sorry, <laughs> Pop and Mom. Uh, they're both licensed to let you get out of the truck and go for walks and things like that, and, and he knows the elephants. Those branches he has pulled down from, he's climbed the tree and dropped those branches down, and these elephants are going to come right up, right up to us right here, and I'm just having her show us that there's a little bit. We're on the Zambezi River, so li and they're licensed to take you canoeing. That was a, a really extraordinary thing. Watch out for the hippos all over the place. And there's generally hippo avoidance is what going on the river was. But we'd find shallows and go swimming. Uh, alligators and I don't know how to get a picture. Uh, this was a wild, I didn't, I didn't know this was gonna happen and suddenly three elephants are crossing the river and our two guides are just paddling like mad and we're staying about 15, 20 feet behind them as they cross the river over the island. This is what happens if you get involved with sage. <laughs> <laughs> this is where it leads you. This was a lot of fun. It was also kind of expensive, but uh, my wife my wife being a veterinarian, this was, I told everybody this is, uh, 
Why so she let me go? It's a tax write-off since she's a vet, right? I, yeah, I wish, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, so, uh, so you're contributing that to a user's guide. Uh, exotic places to see is used. That would be a nice tutorial. Yeah, yeah right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. All right, so I love this quote from William that's in the French sage book. The more and more I think about it, the more and more I believe it's true. And the, and the more I really think about the importance of their algebra and sort of the underpinnings of a lot of things going on in sage. Yeah. I don't have anything against William, but I'm 99.9% .9 sure that quote is the long piece. The long two? The long piece. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. The, the, the interact that somebody, it might have been what somebody showed with the SVD decomposition the other day, I forget when that was. I stole that from William, and I was in a room presenting it, and I credited William, and he piped up. I stole that from a student. So, so if you want to do linear, I will talk a little bit more about linear algebra, but, but almost this is all you really need to do. If you know how to make a vector and you know how to make a matrix, and I think everybody in the room is, is, is at this point now. You can use dot whatever to see your methods. You can put a question mark on the end of a method to see what it really does. And you, of course, can do the double if you really want to get down into the social code. So uh, that's sort of, that's one of my takes and, and partly why I, I think matrix constructors are important. Not that, that we could get by with just one. But I've built a lot of matrix constructors lately. Build the darn thing, and this is true of any area of SAGE. If you can make one of the things, then you, and, and you've learned, that's what I'm trying to do with my book. Really learn what's available for linear algebra, and then if you want to go do differential equations or symbolics or whatever, you should be uh, off. Sort of some highlights of the linear algebra code is you get back vector spaces for a lot of things. So if you're going to do a span or a kernel or whatever it might be, you get back a vector space that walks like a vector space and talks like a vector space. You can ask for its dimension. You can ask for a basis. Rather than some of the other systems I've used where if you ask for a, a null space or a kernel, you don't get a null space or a kernel, you get a collection of basic vectors. And of course, we all know what to do with that, and that's part of what, what I've been doing. If Mathematica or whatever gives us a collection of basis vectors, we're happy and we're ready to go. But Sage gives you a vector space, and as a student getting started, that's pretty neat. There is this object that is a vector space, and it acts and behaves like a vector space. Uh, support for lots of rings, either just through the general code that will work over any ring or field, depending on what you're trying to do, or really fast stuff over the integers or the rationals. Uh, mod 2, mod n. There's special stuff for symbolics that initially make it faster, but there's some things available there that are nice. What am I forgetting, Jason? Matrix underscore what? Symbolic. Symbolic, I just mentioned symbolic. Yeah, yeah. Okay. sorry. Yeah. That's all right. Columns. Pardon me? Callable symbolic. Okay. Call, yeah, callable. Right. Callable. You put callable functions. Okay. Uh, lots of great exact stuff, and this is a big less personal lesson from all my sabbatical work. Exact stuff is fun and kind of easy. Floating point is hard, and all I'm doing is wrapping NumPy stuff, but then doc testing it is really hard. Different platforms do different things. You get negative zeros. You get sign changes. Get, certainly, uh, you've got to chop off a few digits sometimes to get doc test to work, and then different platforms fail in different ways. So uh, I, I got excited about flowing point, and I'm going to continue it, but it's it's slow going, and then not many people are as interested in reviewing it too. So, so, so. so my linear algebra book, uh, these are just sort of the goals, if you were, the things I wanted to do. Put lots of instructions in about linear algebra. I also wanted to sort of ask leading questions and. I think there was a little bit of that in Tom's book mentioned the other day. Uh, you know, try this. What do you think will happen if you do this? And I can certainly start adding a lot more exercises and that thing, but that's part of it. Uh, you're not popping between the book and the whatever. It's, it's all right there. So having the tool sort of available to you right in the text. Uh, at, at some point in the book, I, I finally get to the point where I say, how does how does Sage test that two vector spaces are equal? Because that's one of the things you can do with vector. You can intersect them and all, but you can test for equality. How does Sage know that two vector spaces are equal? Well, they both have bases. And at this point, the students know there are infinitely many possible bases. But Sage will always take the basis vectors, make them the rows of a matrix, and row reduce that matrix. 
So there's a canonical basis, choice, representation, whatever you want to call it, and then it's the, the quality of those two bases that, that allows Sage to tell if the two vector spaces are equal. So at some point in the course, the students realize all that, and in my book, it's like day three, reduced row echelon form is unique. And so all the way back to a theorem from the first week, but you got to pile up a lot of stuff and a lot of experience with Sage that you can finally sort of look under the hood. So even explaining how the mathematics they are learning makes the mag what might appear to be magic in Sage work. And even b b before that, I talk here. Once a basis shows up, how does Sage carry an infinite object, a vector space, in a finite machine? You know, maybe that doesn't bother students, but there's some mathematics. Uh, so I've been accused of hiding this stuff, making it hard to find. It is it is available, but it's not it's not linked in with the book and all that kind of stuff yet. So there's a wiki page. Say this is a Sage wiki, and and I never know. I never remember the address. I just go Beezer wiki worksheet Sage something like that. Um, I'll come back to this. That's the best place to get Tom's book right now. That's pretty much complete, but we're calling it Alpha Quality down there. So that's the abstract algebra. Yeah, the abstract algebra book. This is where I'm posting progress on the linear algebra. Uh, pretty much eigenvalues I need to do, and I'm not going to do a lot for linear transformations. Um, some, but not a lot. And I was making a PDF, but I've sort of given up on that temporarily. But I'm not so interested. In so you can, I, I think you can get to that pretty quick. There's a link in the talk. So I've written a lot of patches. Uh, Sage has had a row orientation or a row preference from the beginning. That's kind of nice when you're printing stuff out on a computer screen, I think, especially if your rows aren't being laid out as rows with this list of lists, things of that sort. I like to do things with columns, I'm not arguing against rows. I prefer columns. Uh, I like you know, matrix multiplication, A times X. I prefer that than the other way around. I've done a lot of work to try and sort of give columns a little better standing or a little easier without destroying any of the row orientation. That sometimes leads to little discussions about how certain things are done. But they, they, they can coexist. And I think I've sort of come around to the idea that a vector isn't a row or column. When you say a vector is a row or column, you're thinking there are matrices around. And the way my book is laid out, it, it's sort of vectors, vectors, vectors. For, well, there are matrices to do reduce row echelon form. But, uh, they're not interacting so much with the vectors, so much. But anyway, a vector space has vectors, and a vector is just a list, I think, an ordered list. That's sort of what I've come around to, and it, and it doesn't matter so much anymore. Uh, so I built lots of matrix constructors, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the inner product was has always just sort of been on the reals, but you could put vectors with complex entries in there, and it, do, it would do what it would do to the reals, which I think is the wrong thing for complex. So I've, I've got to put a a lot of work into getting the inner product with complex entries to conjugate one piece. And the right thing to do in Sage, and maybe the right thing to do everywhere, uh, is backwards from my book. So I sort of need to go through the book and put all my conjugates in the other half of the vector. Uh, there was a Gram-Schmidt, but it was sort of all you needed to do number theory or something like that, and it had some bugs. Uh, so I've, I've tried to rework that, make that fast, so <coughs> both exact and floating point. A whole lot of work to reorganize matrix kernels. So I wanted to add, this is, this is how I got started really in Sage development. The basis I have in my book for a null space or a kernel is different than the, null, the basis that Sage, Sage will default to. And I wanted to get that basis out, and it was almost universally being computed anyway. I just needed to intercept it in the code and, and save it. If the code had been added onto and bolted on, and it was here and it was there, I couldn't even figure out where to catch it consistently and get it back out again. So and this is what happens. So I just decided I'm just going to take it all apart and put it all back together again. And I didn't change any of the actual code. It was just reorganizing it. And if and done right, nobody will ever notice. But it has a few functions left over that you couldn't fit it. <laughs> <laughs> like a few screws left over. Yeah, right. Yeah, a few screws and left over. Leave. I should I actually put a, I put a, you know I stuck in my basis is what I, the basis I wanted that was added on in the process. But if you come along and, and do a new specialized class of matrices, I hope it is very easy to put in a, 
the, a new well space. You'll know where to put it and how to put it, and, and you can isolate it. So, so that's that's just sort of for the good of Sage. That's not going to make my book any better. It's not going to make a student's experience any made down the road. But uh, but it's also a lot of work. Rational canonical form. I did uh, our, our two matrices is is similar. Our two matrices similar. Dan Drake reviewed the patch, and in certain instances where the eigenvalues are things we can't represent or can't get our hands on, it basically I got to got to throw back. I don't know. I forget exactly what came back. But at some point after trying enough things. You just got to throw your hands up and say, we, we can't tell if these two matrices are similar. With rational canonical form, you can, and, and this is a result of a lot of travel and being, it, it's a result of Eva moving Sage Days a week earlier and giving me a few days to cool my heels in Canada and visit some people and, and by request from somebody that uses Sage quite heavily for algebra and graph theory and, and you know, pointed me to some papers. And that's what I've been, other than organizing Sage Days, that's sort of what I've been doing since uh, I was last up. I've been doing a lot of wrapping the floating, I think I'm going to have to stall on that for a little while just to do some other things, but then there's a lot of routines up to review on that, but I, I'd like to get, so in Africa there's the big five, I think that's from hunting days, the things you want to go out and shoot, and I, I'm thinking, you know, a blog post, the big five of matrix decompositions, SVD, QR, sure, I don't know, I forgot the all five, but uh, I think I'd like to have all five of those exact, even if they're toy implementations, and all five floating point, and that's, that's really about uh, a second course in linear algebra, and I think I may split out part of my book that makes a two-page chain in, in, in a second volume that's more appropriate for what I taught in South Africa, the kind of material that I was teaching to sort of graduates, master's level students, that kind of thing. So it all, you know. Uh, so, like I said, I've had, I've had great support from my institution for open textbooks and SAGE. And we are, you know, our emphasis is on teaching. We, we are supposed to do research. I have done research. Uh, we're not just teaching, but uh, that's a big emphasis at my place. And it's, it's very nice that it's supported. Uh, SAGE can open doors to exciting adventures. You know? So people ask me, how did, how did, how did you end up at, you know, in, in Africa? And I go back just telling them how did I learn about SAGE, and that was a, a correspondent on my book sending me error reports in 2006. Hey, have you heard of SAGE? You know, there's a typo on page 37, and have you heard of SAGE? And that's that's all I got to say. Uh, this is, I, I didn't emphasize this as I was speaking, but uh, you, you teach SAGE, you will find things to do in terms of development. I'm talking about, talking about building worksheets, but in terms of, of working on SAGE itself. Uh, I, very early on, I said, you know, I've been listing things, and I forget what. And I said, you know, here's a vector space, but if you type list, it will give you an error message on a vector space because it's infinite. I wrote that, you know, that was going to go in the book. And then I went over to my terminal and, and, and started to make the code to get the error message and listing two-dimensional two vector space over the rationals. It just kept going, just sat there, just hung, you know. So bug report, and we we have iterators on infinite objects, and that's nice if you just want to plow through an infinite object until you find something of interest or enough things or whatever it might be, and then you stop. But if you do dot list on most anything, it will just call the iterator until the iterator quits. And of course, all the rationals it's on a vector space, that iterator is not going to quit. You know, and so there was some discussion about who needed what, and finally it, it was sort of resolved that. Uh, if the object knows it's infinite and you just ask for a list, it will crap out and say, no, sorry. But there are still things that are going to hang, but that's because maybe it's hard to decide if they're infinite or not, or the code just hasn't been added to make that decision. So that's what I mean. And I loved, I loved watching William teach his course this spring because he'd be doing three days on graph theory and suddenly there were ten graph theory tickets in track, you know, and, and, or, or post to Sage Devel. I just discovered today in class that XYZ is horribly broken, you know, and, you know, so you teach something. And my attitude has always been, oh, you know, an infinite vector space, it just hangs. Well, we'll move along. Okay. You should at least at a minimum, you know, put it into track so that somebody knows about it and, and, and realizes it's a bug if they're not too experienced or somebody looking for a project can fix it. But what I've been doing this year, and this is why it's slow work, is when it doesn't work, I of course file the ticket, but then I sit down and try and fix it. It's something I think I can do. So that, that makes for slow going, but I think it makes it a lot better. 
I really enjoyed just saying, okay, I've done a little bit of abstract algebra, but I really enjoyed just saying, okay, I'm just going to beat on the linear algebra code. And, and I, I love doing graph theory, and I haven't done very much of it for a few months, and, and maybe I'll drop the linear algebra at some point and go beat on graph theory if I can find the time. But it's been, been really a good experience to just say, tunnel vision, linear algebra, no symbolics, no plotting. It's tempting to do, you know, it's tempting to run off and do all the things you're interested in, and you can't do it. Uh, it's good to have your fingers in a lot of the different pies over time, but it's really fun to just say linear algebra. And, and, it, and it's even better if you can find somebody who likes to review your stuff and is willing to come along for the ride. So uh, people know Nathan Cohen in graph theory. You know, you, you can post a patch in graph theory and Nathan Cohen will be all over it in a day or two. And, uh, so. All right, so there's some links to follow up on that. Thanks. Any questions for our speaker? <laughs> yeah, so correct me if I'm wrong, but you didn't do much with linear algebra and differential equations in your book, right? No, there's nothing. Okay, so get patch. Uh, well, actually, I was going to ask if anybody in the room has a lot of experience with SAGE and differential equations. Okay. Just as Elias and the maxima, just sort of played around with it about that. Okay, well, I've got a potential project. David Joyner. David Joyner is yeah. I've got a potential project because I've got a 400 uh, page manuscript for an ordinary differential equations textbook that could be made open source and it begging for SAGE. And it's heavy into linear algebra. So if anybody wants to talk to me about it, there's on the. might produce a lot of upstream patches for Maxima. Yeah. yeah. On the Teaching with SAGE page on the wiki, there's a course. Uh, I know Marshall. Yeah, There's a lot of people in the prep workshop that are heavy, like, numerical applied people that have been doing a lot of worksheets about using SAGE and applied math that might be really interested in uh, taking a look at some of that stuff. But that's a target course for the FLs, so. Yeah. So we should, uh, we should talk more. Put it out there, yeah. Yep. Are you getting to teach it, Tom? Hmm? Are you getting to teach I didn't got I'm concentrating it on abstract algebra, and I didn't think I could get both, and I'm going to have to wrestle it away from a certain person who's sort of got the market cornered on it. Mm -hmm. and I, think I was could, just curious if you won the wrestling match. Uh, you know, I'm, I haven't yet, but I've sort of been chipping away from it. I keep okay. requesting, and I'm going to wear them down by attrition or something. <laughs> Marshall Hampton the, the, was the first SAGE developer to go to teach it. I'm going back in January and trying to squeeze in three weeks before my classes start. Other questions? All right, we'll, uh, we'll go 10 minutes for coffee, snacks, whatever. Let Jason get set up. So that'll be a big hand on two. <laughs>